Well, it's definitely time to start start class. So today we are going to be looking at some nonlinear models. Uh, the title of the lesson is "What If Align Does Not Fit the Data: Curved Best Fit Models." So, particularly last semester in, in November-ish, right? We looked at a variety of linear models um, for modeling data, but Hey, what if what if you grab the data and you plot it and um, and you look at it and you're like, hmm, I don't think a line really models this data well. So we're going to look at that today, and we're going to also look at something called a piecewise function because sometimes the behavior that we observe initially for a situation is not the behavior that remains. There's a lot of examples of that. We're going to look at one um, in regards to the consumption of uh, oil, hydrocarbons. Um, but we can think of uh, examples in terms of uh, um, medical situations that you might know of. Um, some of those initial steep curves were scary. And, uh, and then it turns out that the curves that we looked at didn't quite pan out. They weren't quite as scary a curves uh, once more data came in. So uh, well, let's start with question. 103 103 and it encourages us to go all the way back and recall Julia's father remember they had a pizza shop she went out to uh, figure out what they should charge for pizza at their house and uh, at their restaurant and toppings recall that Julia's father uses dry ice to keep glasses in his restaurant very cold very cold you pull them out of this thing and they're cold the dry ice sublimates in the restaurant cooler. Sublimates. I need to look. I want to look that up. Oh, okay. So sublimation is the transition of a substance directly from the solid to the gas state. So I, dry ice is it's it's frozen carbon dioxide, right? Frozen carbon or yeah, carbon dioxide, CO two and frozen co2 sublimates it goes from a solid directly to a gas without becoming a liquid that is sublimation so the dry ice sublimates in the restaurant cooler as shown in the table at right and i, I believe that this table is where did i put it mm, i put the table down below so this is the table and this is her measuring the weight of the dry ice in number of hours after noon and then the weight in ounces. So the first thing we're asked to do is it says um, recreate the scatter plot and the LSRL of this data uh, on your calculator. Well, we're not using our calculators this year, right? We're using um, Desmos. So let's go do let's go set that up and do that in Desmos. So to save time, I did type the values in earlier, and I and I believe that in your ebook, I think you can actually just grab these values and you don't need to to type them in. I think that they have a, a sheet set up like this. I don't like their pre-prepared sheet because it seems like it's got a lot of extra things also. But here's the data data table. Um, if I, to, to add data like this, remember we hit the plus and then we add a table. And then uh, I've entered these as X1s and Y1s. So if I want to now, what I can do is go ahead and um, figure out the least square regression line for this data. And to do that, I just, uh, in the box, type the following. We type uh, Y and then just the number one. It automatically will make it a subscript. And it says there's 11 elements in this data set numbered from 0 to 10. So Y1, and then we hit uh, tilde. So I do shift tilde, not equals, but the little, little single curve there. So Y1, and then I just type M, X1, and then plus B. And it's beautiful, right? There is the least square regression line. A uh, couple things it gives me is I know that the equation of this line is Y is equal to um, negative 0.52 X plus about 15.2. So I can see both the, um, both the slope and the Y intercept in the data. So one of the things that uh, we discussed was how do I know if a linear model works well? Well, it's hard to reject this linear model just looking at this because look at the correlation coefficient. It's 0.9979. 
and the coefficient of determination is 0.9958. Um, but perhaps, I mean, certainly in this very narrow range, right, if I was to pick values just between 0 and 10, I probably would do a pretty good job of predicting the weight of the dry ice. The problem I have is does this model bear out as I continue as, as time goes on or does things, do things start to change? And we can see evidence that if we look at a residual plot. So if I click plot here, it calculated all the residuals for me. And if I scroll down a little bit, I can see the actual residuals here shown in blue. Now, if I, if I extend the y-axis or drag the y-axis out, the thing that I see is this pattern in the residual plot. Right? I don't see that it's going you know, up, down, up, down, just randomly scattered above it or around it. I see this evidence of the residuals are positive and then the residuals become negative and they stay negative and then they become positive again. So when we see a pattern like this in the residual plot, it's a pretty good indication that this data is probably not linear, right? The best model for this data is not linear. Perhaps there's some curve that should be fitting this data better. So if we come back and look at it, it says, what does this residual plot tell you about the original data that Julia collected? Well, to, to me, what it's telling me is that, well, it's probably a, a linear model is probably not a good fit for the data. What type of function might fit the data better? Better, better, better. Well, the thing that we've been discussing is an exponential function, and I, I think trying one of those right now would be a reasonable thing. So we're asked to use our calculator to determine the exponential regression equation. So we're, we're still using Desmos. And I want to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how we would, it's very much the same that we would do for a linear one, right? If I wanted a linear model, remember it's, whoop, I don't need this orange pen. It would, for a linear model, it would be Y1. And you just type Y in the number one and it'll make it a subs subscript, tilde, and then M x1 and then plus b and you know that it's going to give us the two parameters we need the parameters we need to determine the line are the slope parameter and the y-intercept parameter well if i want to come up with an exponential curve that models the data i would use y1 if that's where my data is and, and it is y1 tilde and then i'm just going to type a b and then i'm going to go to the x1 power and what Desmos will do is it'll it'll attempt to give me the two parameters, the um, zeroth term parameter and the multiplier parameter, so that I can come up with the line of fit for this data. So it says use your calculator to determine the exponential regression equation. Add this graph to the scatter plot. Be sure to label the graph with the equation. Okay, so let's go back to Desmos. Uh, back to Desmos. There we are. So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to leave this data here, but I'm going to go ahead and hide. Oops, wrong wrong place. I'm going to hide the um, the line of best fit, and I'm also going to turn off the residual from the linear relationship. So let's come back up here, and I'm gonna, you hold down Shift, and I can shrink, compress my y-axis again, so that I can see the model better. There's my data again. And again, here's the linear model that we came up with. You can see that we can turn it on. But now let's come up with an exponential model. So in the next available box, I'm going to go ahead and type again uh, y1 and then tilde. But this time, ab. And I'm going to raise that to the x1 power. And when I do that, you can see what happened, right? It generated this, this curve. And it's pretty evident that it's a curve. I mean, it's not super evident, but if I, if I drag out, <clears throat> zoom out a little bit, you can see, oh yeah, it's clearly doing something different. So, you know, the reason why it mat matters is this data was fine being approximated by a line and the correlation coefficient was strong, but if something else is happening and perhaps something else is happening here, this model is, is it could be much, much better. And, and by that, what I mean is we're looking for not having large residuals, right? When we look at a model, we want to know that the model is giving us the least error possible. And when you have a model that, um, you know, if the model is predicting, like, for example, if the model is predicting at 30, 
that you're going to have zero dry ice and really you still have some dry ice or wherever the actual data is that's a larger residual and that just means that your model is off and it's not giving you the best possible prediction for what is going to be happening so I, the book suggests this and i want to take a look at it it suggests looking at a residual plot um, for the um, nonlinear model. So let me go ahead and turn off the linear model. There we are. And for this, I wanted to actually plot the residuals as well. So I just turned on a residual plot. And if you look up here, it does have a new set of data now. These are the residuals for the exponential model. And as I look at these numbers, just looking at them, right, I can see that in general, the residuals here are much smaller. Each individual residual smaller. Um, I've got some residuals in here that are like um, one, almost 0.2, I mean 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, I don't see any residuals over here. Well, there's just one, 1 1.4. So this is the this is the one residual, I guess that is is beating the the linear model is beating this one particular data point's residual. But in general, these residuals are smaller than their neighbors next door. Look at this one at the at the extremes. This residual is almost 2, and this one's 0.03. Um, let's go down and look at those residuals. So I'll, I'll come down and we can see it, and I'll just scale this up a little bit. So one of the things that I see that's different here is instead of it being such a clear up, down, up pattern, look at this. There's some that are down, up, up, down, down, on the line, down, up, up. So what I'm looking at here, and this is with a small data set, what I'm looking at is that there's a lot of scatter around the, the line uh, x equal, or y equals zero, like the x-axis. Because I see all that scatter, I don't see a very clear, like, like if I turn these on, we'll see more of a clear, yeah. We see more of a just, it's high, low, high. Whereas this one's got some data that's, it's, it's generally closer, if you look at it, it's generally, the purple dots are generally closer to the line x equals zero. Mm, that's the line y equals zero, the x-axis. Um, and, and because of that, there's less error. Okay, so let's move away from the pizza restaurant's super cold glasses and go to question 104. So 104 says, below is a list of amounts of oil produced from 1905 to 1972. MMBBL stands for millions of barrels, MMBL, and is the standard abbreviation used by the oil industry. So you can see here, 1905, there's 215 million, million barrels of oil. Um, in 1972, 18, that's, that's a lot. It's 18,000 million barrels. 18,584 million. So you've got to add a lot of zeros uh, onto that to make that work. So the first thing we're asked to do here is to create a scatter plot of the data uh, with Desmos and sketch the result on your paper. Well, uh, let's just have you just, mm, uh, honestly, I think what I'm going to have to do is come up with another task that you guys are gonna do uh, independently. And actually there's one in the homework that you'll do there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and continue to step through um, these next two problems together with you. And then you'll use this information to complete, complete the assignments. So let's go ahead and take a look at the graph of this. It, it is set up in Desmos and it's dying for us to go visit. So let's go Desmos, here we go. And uh, when I look at this data, I'm thinking, well, okay, this is not linear. This is not a linear situation. Um, I can come in here and I can definitely, uh, hmm, I could definitely fit a line to this data, right? I can, I can model it with a line. And if I wanted to do that, you know what I would be typing, right? Y and then the number one. Why Y1? Because my data is in Y1, X1, right? My X's are stored in X1, my Y's are stored in Y1. So I'm making reference to the list and it says, okay, there's 18 numbers, 18 elements in that list. So Y1 tilde, and then I just do MX1, oh, no, not exclamation mark, X1, and then plus the B. There we go. 
So there's a linear model for this data. It is the best, it, it is the line of best fit. Um, you can see that the correlation coefficient is significantly lower than the last problem. And you can see, yeah, there's, there's, there's points all over the place, right? Now, if you look, you clearly see here you've got positive residuals that become negative residuals that become positive again. So if I was to look at the residual plot, oh, that is the residual plot. If you look at the residual plot, you're like, man, that looks an awful lot like the data itself. This is an excellent example of... <clears throat> a time when you're not going to use a model. Even looking at the data set itself, you know, a linear model is not what I'm going to be using. So let's go ahead and get rid of this linear model. And instead, let us consider an exponential model. So now I'm going to type y1 and then tilde, and I'm going to go ab raised, raised to the uh, x1 power. And I come up with this beautiful curve okay so uh, this this is a model that is attempting to tell me what's happening with the data and uh, my residuals are much smaller than they were and I can see here my two parameters this is telling me my zero with term is hundred and ten millions of barrels of oil and my multiplier is 1.07 so it's about about a seven percent increase year over year right and when things multiply by 7% repeatedly, you can see, man, the growth really takes off at a certain point. So the story there, if we ended, is just like, oh my gosh, uh, we're never going to have enough oil, right? And uh, oil is going away quickly. And then, and then something happened, right? You weren't alive. I was, I was alive. Something happened. We had the oil crisis in the late 70s. Um, you can see this is 72. And then all of a sudden we started getting really way more efficient with our use of hydrocarbons that we are harvesting and uh, our demand for them curtailed pretty pretty rapidly and 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 on top of that we found more supplies so let's let's take the last topic i want to talk about is um this idea that sometimes one model is not enough right if we sh see a shift in behavior, if we see a model doing one thing and then all of a sudden uh, there's a new behavior that's governing what we're, what we're observing, let's not stick with the same model we have. Let's, let's use what we are, we're going to call a piecewise model. And the piecewise model says, well, in this certain chunk of the x-axis, right, for this certain uh, chunk of our domain, we're going to use one equation to model the data. But then when we see the behavior shift, we're going to use another model to shift what's happening. Let's go uh, back to the textbooks and I'll, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> piecewise model. So below is a continuation of the data for the amount of oil production. Compare your prediction for 1986 to the amount uh, given in this table. Okay, so we were asked to use that graph. And you know, I wonder how difficult that is that we wanted to, let's see, 1996. Um, the this was the the data was that we had was in that we said it was encoded what that meant is that these were these were we treated the year 1900 as year zero so in our data set um, that we typed the years were years past 1900 so if i go back and i look at desmos here um no nope, that's not desmos desmos here you can see that these numbers they do not look like years right this is five, 10, how are these years? Well, this was 1915, 1940, 1962, 1972. So if I use this model, I can predict how much oil um, we're, we're going to be consuming it. They said in the year 1996, 1996. So the, the question was, uh, yeah, how much will, will be in production in 1996? So I can come along here and I can say, well, this is 75. Oh my gosh, so I gotta zoom out. If I want to see 1996, uh, that's 1983, um, 1990, okay, okay, 1990, okay, it's insane, right? So 1996 is here. Now, I, these are, these represent millions of barrels per, of oil, but you can see, I'm just going to read the number, it's 106,301. 106,000, 106,301. 
106,301. Now, let's go look at uh, what actually happened. So if we, if we look at what actually happened, by the time 1996 rolled around, <clears throat> this is nowhere near 106,000, right? It's 23,000. So we are off by a magnitude, what was it, 106,448. <clears throat> We're off by a magnitude of, um, what is it, four times, five times, five times the difference. So clearly something else happened, right? And this, this trend that we saw did not persist, like different behavior began. So let's look at that. So these, this is a continuation of that same data set. So let's go back and look at Desmos and see what happened with the, with the newer model. So now I have three different sets of data. I have the data that we were just looking at, which is here, and I can show that data. And then I have the continuation of that data set um, going on from 1974 to the year 1996. And if I turn that on, um, there's, there's something that emerges from that, right? But you can see that there's this shift downward by quite a bit, and then this behavior is what seems to be governing. So what I'm gonna propose we do is let's go ahead and turn uh, that off and just look at from the years, um, I think it was 1976, what was this year? Nope, 1982. From 1982 onward, right? This is a totally different different model at this point. So <clears throat> if I was to look at this, I would say I, ca I cannot use just the exponential model, right? And this, this data, by the way, the green dots are stored in X1 and Y1. So I can come in here, I can say um, Y1 and tilde um, A, B, raised to the x1 power and I can see that behavior but I know that that's not what happened this is where the data went instead and 1996 is here but the prediction for 1996 is way the heck up there at a hundred and a hundred and ten thousand right it's way off so what do we look at here instead well there there was a shift right there was a shift in efficiency and all of a sudden there was a less need for hydrocarbons and or, or oil specifically so it's a different thing so let's build a model for this chunk of the data and this data is stored in uh, x3 and y3 so if I build a model for that I can say y3 tilde um, m times x1 and uh, yeah no, X3, I gotta be careful, X3, those are in three, and then plus uh, B. So, <clears throat> so my proposal is that, well, we're not gonna look at just one of these models from year zero to about the year um, 1972. We've got this one model that we'll use, but then past 1972, picking up somewhere around 82, like there's this 10 year gap, all of a sudden things change dramatically. And the difference between uh, where this model predicted, right, the new linear part predicts it, the new linear model's right on there, and where, so where is the 100, where is the year 1996? So 96 is, I have to zoom out even more. It's so far out, uh, that's only 89. I have to, I'm way out. Uh, there's 94, 95. So pretty much near the top of the screen is where 1996 is. And you can see that's not what happened. What happened is way down here. So <clears throat> again, it's a good tell. It's a good cautionary tell that sometimes when we see these, these crazy, crazy models that are produced based on initial, initial observations, um, you got to wait for more data co to come in because sometimes, sometimes it, if you get more data in, your your decisions and the things that you do are going to be governed by um, maybe less alarmism and, and more realism. So, <clears throat> to use just one model would be bad. So let's write down the model we would use, how we would des describe these two different situations, and this idea of a piecewise function. 
So here is the end of our story. And we've landed on this idea that we will call a piece, a piecewise function. Piecewise, let me write that word down. So this is a piecewise model for our observations from historical data that we're looking at. Um, and the, the story is, is that this, right, this behavior did not happen forever, right? It happened from the year 1900 to about 1982. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. So to about in here somewhere. So for this chunk of the domain, right? If you look at what I'm writing here, I said as, lo as long as the years is years past 1900 is greater than zero, but less than or equal to about 82, that top function is gonna be the model that describes the behavior. But then something shifts and past that point, there's a new behavior that takes over and that's governed by this model. And, you know, we'll have to see, I think we, we have, we have another 20 years of data and I think it's showing pretty similar trends to the second linear model at that point. But we'll have to see over time, you know, does it stay linear forever or does something else happen? And if, if we were to graph this, then it would look something like, something like this, right? But then all of a sudden we see this shift and it doesn't keep going this way. What happens is now this model kicks in and we see this happening. So this is what we mean by a piecewise function for a certain chunk of the domain. That's the domain is the X axis down below for a certain chunk of the domain. One functions governing the behavior we see or modeling the behavior that we see. And then past that, there's another. And there's no reason why we can't extend this and have two or three or more functions that are describing what's happening. But this is kind of roughly how, how it looks like this function f of x is attempting to model the number of billions of barrel of oil production used and used in the, U, uh, in the world. And uh, for a certain time range, it's one value. For another time range, it's another. All right, this is Mr. Roberts. Hope you have a great Thursday. I will see you again soon.